some of the some of the people who've gotten some of the most incredible benefits is CrossFitters, because CrossFit is intense and they lift heavy and they go hard. But when we bring in some of this stuff into that arena, it's like, oh, my goodness, I can now actually move. I can get my arms above my head. I can squat down with my arms above my head. And I don't have that restriction. I don't have that pain. I'm not getting either too much or not enough movement out of my lumbar spine or thoracic spine. So that's the the power of it. And we can't throw one out with the other. We have to incorporate. You have to use some load at some time uh, because the body needs that. It's good for bone tissue. It's good for muscle tissue. It's good for the fascial matrix. We need to have both the slow and and simple and the heavy and the fast relative to your ability level. Hi, I'm Pete McCall. Welcome to this episode of All About Fitness. That voice you just heard in the introduction was Rodney Korn. But before I get into the introduction of who Rodney is and what we're going to talk about in this episode of All About Fitness... I want to take a moment to say howdy and give a shout out to a few people I bumped into recently on a trip I made to, to Orlando, Florida. First, I want to say th- say thank you to Amber. To Amber and your entire team at your studio in Ocala, I want to say just how much I appreciate your coming up to me. And Amber, especially, uh, just thank you for taking the time or taking a moment to tell me uh, how much you like the podcast. And for listeners, I really appreciate it. If we're at the same event or you bump into each other, Please let me know if we, we if we get a chance to meet. I, I love hearing from listeners, and, and it, it's good to know that you're getting something out of this podcast. <laughs> to be honest, I record this in my closet, basically. I have my own little makeshift studio here. So I put it out. I'm not sure how people take it. I see the numbers. I see the downloads. But to hear that people are getting something out of this means the world to me. So thank you, Amber. I'd also like to give a big shout-out to Marielle. Marielle, thank you for being a volunteer. Well, I kind of drug you into a couple of them, but thank you so much. It was a pleasure chatting with you and seeing you again. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you again a little bit later this year at, at another an event. And to Mariana, Mariana, really, I is so fun to see you again. And thanks for taking the time again to come to a couple of sessions. And viva Colombia. If we bump into each other, by all means, say hello and introduce yourself. And for listeners, if you take the time, if you enjoy All About Fitness, if you enjoy this podcast on a regular basis, I'm not charging you anything. Yes, I'm trying to promote my book, Smarter Workouts, The Science of Exercise Made Simple. Shameless plug and promotion right there. Uh, Yes, I'm trying to promote my book. But the reality is I'm just trying to put good information out there that you can use to enhance your quality of life. So if you like that, please pause for a moment, reach down and hit like or hit, give me a review, give the podcast a review, however you're listening to it, Stitcher, iTunes, whatever platform you're on, please give it a review because you know how this works. The more reviews you have, the better up, higher up in the search rankings you go. On to this episode's guest. Rodney Korn easily is one of the more influential people in in the fitness industry as an educator. He's been an educator for a long time, and he's had a very strong impact, a very significant impact on my career going back until I first met Rodney when I taught the NASM certification for a large health club company I worked for. And and Rodney and his whole team, there's Bobby Capuccio, Lenny Pericino, you, you know, these guys, Scott Lucette, Jeff Diltz, these guys were NASM and, and really helped kind of bring NASM to the forefront of the certification game. You know, but Rodney has evolved and has, has gone on to do fabulous things. And what we're going to talk about today is kind of mind blowing because when was the last time? I and mean, I mean this, when was the last time you walked into a gym thinking, today's the day I'm going to train my emotions. But here's the thing, how you move dictates how you feel. And conversely, how you feel dictates how you move. This is what we talk about today. It's the relationship between emotion and mo- emotion and motion. You know, how the, your emotional state impacts everything else in your body. You know, our, we're a collection of individual cells. We have billions of cells in our body. And the, the, the brain, the heart, the, everything is connected. And to sit there and to try to isolate and say, well, I'm feeling bad today, but I'm still going to go exercise can be tough. So on this episode of All About Fitness, Ronnie and I talk about, first of all, we start with fascia because Ronnie is an expert in understanding the tissue that moves the body. And his program, Feel Soma, goes really into the detail about what you need to know about the connective tissues in your body. And then we talk about the emotional state and how exercise influences how you feel. Very powerful stuff. So you have tuned in to a phenomenal episode of the All About Fitness podcast. I'm going to have information below on how you can learn more about Rodney Korn and more about the Feel Summer program. 
We're going to have a quick word from the sponsors of All About Fitness. And then it really is. This is a, as you can tell, I'm stoked about this conversation. I'm actually going to, I'm posting this on the day that I actually recorded the conversation, which usually I, you know, there's a lead time, but this is such a strong interview. I'm bumping it up. I'm pushing a few other people aside. Sorry about that because I want you to hear this. First, before we get into the interview with Rodney Korn, if you're looking for a training platform, whether for home or your gym, check out the TerraCore. And by training platform, I mean, do you want a bench? Do you want a step? Do you want something that can really light up all the muscles in your body? Well, go to www.terracorefitness.com. That's T-E-R-R-A, corefitness.com. And check out what Men's Health identified as one of the top 25 products that you should have in your home. TerraCore allows you to do a number of different strength exercises, mobility, power, conditioning. You want to do it, you can do it. If you want to move it, or if you can move it, if you can move it, you can do it on the TerraCore. TerraCoreFitness.com. Use code AAF10. That's AAF10 to save 10% on the purchase of a TerraCore. And on Instagram, go to TerraCore Fitness on Instagram. I'm going to have the link in the show notes and see what people are doing the TerraCore. It is amazing. If you're looking for those killer fitness products that can help you get strong, help you lose weight, and just get overall better shape and better health, then check out Sand Bells and Soft Bells by Hyperware. There's a reason why I put Sand Bells in my book, Smarter Workouts, The Science of Exercise Made Simple. That's because they work. Sand bells are what they sound like. They're sandbags. They're easy to move, easy to grip. So for those of us that are starting to feel a little arthritis in our fingers, you want to lift something heavy, you want to move it around, get strong, check out sand bells. And then soft bells are two sand bells that can be joined by either a dumbbell handle or a barbell handle. Go to hyperware.com and see soft bells and sand bells. Use code AAF10. That's AAF10 to save 10% on the purchase of the product. I'm Pete McCall with All About Fitness, speaking today with Rodney Korn. Rodney has been working on a really cool thing about the human body. Rodney, what is it that you're working on these days? Well, right now I'm working with Ian O'Dwyer, and we've been uh, focusing on what's called SOMA. And SOMA stands for self osteomyofascial applications, and it's really a self-care. So it's all about self-care and tissue management, tissue enhancement, just getting people to move, feel, and live better. And that's what we've really been focusing on for the last two years now. And that's what is, so let me ask a question because I think people don't realize, and for general listeners, general consumers, people know they have muscles, but I don't think people realize that there's another tissue that actually is a little bit, I would argue, and maybe you would agree with me, is a little bit more important than muscle. So what are the two primary types of tissue um, when we're talking muscle? Because we have muscle fibers, but what's the other tissue? Well, the other tissue is the big buzzword, which is fascia. And, and fascia is kind of a general term that has been given to the various forms of connective tissue that are in the body. And the connective tissue is essentially this whole fascial matrix, if you will, is what, it, is what connects the entire body. So you see your skin, but as soon as you get right into the skin, actually into the skin and then down all the way into the cells – you have a fascial matrix, which is what connects and separates and allows to slide and glide. And it does just amazing things. It's, it's invested in every area of the body, organs, bones, muscles, everything. So that's, the, that's kind of the big, uh, even though it's a buzzword and there's so many people like, yeah, fascia is not this and fascia is not that. When the research continues to come out, and there's tons of research now, you see that fascia is invested in everything and it has, I personally believe, and there is now articles and people that are coming out saying that it's almost like another brain. So we always think of we have one brain. And in fact, um, my personal philosophy is we have four primary brains that we're, we're able to, uh, kind of consider a brain now and um, fascia I believe is is that fourth one it's it's a huge component because it has its own communication it has its own memory system it has its own ability to contract and to move and so when you look at the the potency behind fascia it's where I believe is we you know looking at emotion and motion which cannot be separated the fascial matrix is where all of our emotions manifest. That's where they become visual. That's where they become able to be read or recognized. And that is, you know, that's pretty fascinating. And, and the whole idea of a brain, 
Because I know I'm familiar with the gut brain and how in the last couple of years there's been a whole argument or theory proposed that that we have a whole different biology of our of our intestines. And mm-hmm. I would agree with you. I think the fascial network has its own neurophysiology that that kind of enhances what the body how the body can move. What's the fourth one, Rod? I'm, I'm I guess I'm not I'm, I'm not familiar with that model. Well, like you had mentioned, the gut brain. So the gut brain, they've known for over 100 years that that's actually a brain. So when we're looking at brain, if you have basic principles that define what a brain is, it has neurotransmitters, it has uh, hormones that are associated with it, it has cells, um, it produces memory, it has storage. So all of these different capacities that are uh, constituents of what would make up a brain. So we know that the head is a brain because that's what we typically think. We know that the gut is one. It's been over 100 years. And we also know that the heart is one. And the heart has been known for almost as long as the gut. So we know that the heart, the, the gut and the heart can work independently of the brain. So you could technically pull your heart out of the body. If you could feed it blood and feed it oxygen, it would continue to be separate of the brain's input. And what we also know is that the gut and the brain feed more information to the head brain than the head brain feeds to it. So the head brain, as it was always thought of being the dictator, it's really not the dictator, it's the synthesizer. And so what it does is it receives all of this input from the gut and the heart and what I also term fascia. So the, think of the, the number one sensory organ in our body is fascia. It has the highest density of mechanoreceptors in the body. So that means that it has the highest amount of input especially from a physical standpoint, into the body or into the brain, I mean. So you have your your fascia, you have your heart, you have your gut, and that feeds the brain all this information. The head brain then has to composite and compose that and create a, a message, so to speak, that it then transfers back to the, the other parts of the body to create a response. So we used to call that in, at NESM when I was at the National Academy of Sports Medicine, we called that sensory motor integration. You would get all this sensory input and then the brain, the head brain would sift through it and then create a motor response. And that's what it is. It's an integrator. It integrates this information to produce a response. So that's kind of your four brains in a nutshell. That, that's pretty awesome. And for listeners, years ago, Rod, Rod and I have known each other for, for years and I used to teach the NASM uh, certification for for a health club company, and I haven't heard that term sensory motor integration for years. I, just, I got like this weird little flashback of like studying in flashcards and oh, you know, the the ability of the neuromuscular system to coordinate, integrate, and you know, it's funny yep. to, to still remember that. But let me ask you this because I don't know if many people are aware that your background is is pretty heavily involved in bodybuilding, correct? Yeah, so I have a component in bodybuilding. So I was I did bodybuilding for probably seven, eight years. Uh, and then I was into powerlifting, Olympic lifting, and then I was did a lot of strength and conditioning. And so I kind of have a right variety of background. Well, and the reason why I ask that is because I make the point that bodybuilding is all about muscle tissue. It's all about active mm-hmm. myosin. And you're loading mm-hmm. force into the muscle. Yet, and, and so bodybuilders generally don't really involve the fascia in their methodology. As, as somebody that, that kind of came of age in that muscle isolation world, how has it changed your approach to exercise to learn more about about this this extra brain or this fourth brain in our body? <laughs> it's what saved, saved my life and allowed me to live to 53. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you mean so, by that? Yeah. Well, you know, going through bodybuilding and anyone who's been in bodybuilding can genuinely attest to you're broken. I mean, you're most bodybuilders have, as do most people for that matter. So it's not it's not so much just the bodybuilder, but it's accentuated because the amount of load, stress, and volume that you put through the body. But your back is sore, your knees are sore, your shoulders hurt, elbows hurt. All these things hurt. All your joints hurt. Well, the reason that joints hurt is because the joints are what – the whole fascial matrix that runs through all your muscle tissue from, from the – largest grouping of muscles all the way down to the individual muscle fibers themselves, there's fascia that surrounds all that. And all of that fascia then goes through the tissue. It wraps around the bone. So it doesn't stop at the bone. It wraps around the periosteum is what covers the bone. And that's the fascial matrix around that. 
And ultimately, that's what's moving and pulling joints. It's also invested in the ligaments. So your ligaments are part of the fascial network and the capsule. So that's what actually gets beat up when you put so much stress through the muscle tissue. That fascia sometimes will uh, have its own response and it, it can get almost like scar tissue. So scar tissue, in essence, is a lot of collagen buildup. And collagen is one of the main, it's obviously the main protein in the body, but it's the main component of what fascia is. So when we get excessive collagen buildup in different areas of the body, and, and an easy one is for people, if you just, if you see a bodybuilder or someone who does lots of repetitive motion, you can go to any muscle belly in their body and you'll find strands of tissue that feel like guitar strings. Mm. Uh, the pec, the pec is a big one. And you can go right to the pec and guys who've done lots of bench, whether it's dumbbell or, or barbell, it doesn't matter. And you run your fingers right up and down their pec you'll feel these big clumpy bands and that's just davis's law that says soft tissue will mold along the, the lines of stress or force and when you put force repetitively through the body through the muscular tissue you're going to create this this increase or the body's desire to increase the collagen or the tissue in that area to support the force that's going through that and when I was bodybuilding and I had lots of aches and pains, I was building up tissue, which wasn't allowing my body to move uh, very well three-dimensionally. So when we have to move in life more three-dimensionally and you go into the gym and it's, though it's technically still three-dimensional mo motion, it's very much more dominant in certain planes of motion. You no longer have the mechanical or proprioceptive ability to move in all of those other, other various ways. And so by learning and understanding that I was able to, to realize that we can manipulate and move that tissue around and start freeing it up to have much more ease and access to the other degrees of motion that are available at joints, which takes pressure off the, the tissues and allows the pain to subside. So, so how might, uh, how, if I were to, for somebody who might want to program or might want to exercise to enhance their fascia and, and we can talk for, for in a couple minutes about kind of how that changes the body what would a, a workout for fascia look like compared to a, lo a work a workout for traditional bodybuilding muscle isolation well that's that's a great question and there's there's different forms of it so you can train the more fascial components by having a little bit more rapid or sometimes even like a, a rapid plyometric type so there's there's like, for instance, you could squat or you could do like a squat jump or a type of bounding type of exercise. Those will place different emphasis on the muscle contraction versus the, the contractile properties of the fascial. So there's, there's one way to do that. Now, that's not overly suggested. I'm not suggesting that people go out and do that because you can create a lot of soreness and a lot of damage by doing that when the body's not ready. But that's something can be done. But also by just creating variation in the motion so instead of just if you're just squatting instead of just squatting with heavy weight repetitive up and down um, speed of motion will change the fascial component that you're doing so going slower oftentimes will will place more stress on the muscular contraction the neuromuscular contraction going faster can put a little bit more on the the fascia but then also changing the direction of the motion so by changing the direction of the motion, so instead of just squatting up and down, taking your foot and, and moving the foot in one direction and squatting and then moving it so you can move it forward towards your, take your right foot towards your left foot and kind of squat and then take it back behind you and squat. Just by changing that, you're now putting different stresses through, even though you're still working the muscular tissue. By changing how the forces are going through the system will then change how the body has to respond. And it's the fascial matrix that then starts to respond because it's, in essence, the, it's the integrity, integral structural system of the body as we start to move that it'll morph and adapt to how we're putting force and stress to the body. So this, by very, varying either your stances varying um, the positions of the body during motion that will help to manipulate and modify how the fascia is being uh, constructed or developed within the, the system which can always change it can always be changed depending on how you move 
So now with your own personal workouts, I mean, you mentioned you're over the age of 50. How do you, I mean, what do you do personally? I mean, you know, you're probably one of the leading experts in the world uh, in this, in this kind of component or in, in this area of, of understanding the body. How do you apply this, Rod, for, for your, for, and, and I say this knowing your, your history and that, that you and I have both been beat up a little bit, but how have you applied this and how do you feel today in terms of your ability to move? Um, well, I always, Ian and I have had many conversations because he's a little bit older than I am. So I'm 53, he's 55 plus. And good answer. We, <laughs> we, we still move as well as most kids that are in their 30s that come to a lot of the workshops that we do. Um, and that's because, one, you still have to do that, but you have to be able to do those motions. And so it's, it's getting back to doing a lot of different varieties of movements. So not, um, not just sticking with traditional, though I do a lots of traditional lifting. So I do traditional squats. Matter of fact, just the other day I was doing squats and I was doing bench press. and I, So I still do a lot of that, but then I don't do that day in and day out. So I'll do a variety of things where I'm using either some type of whole body vibration using a power plate or I'm using some type of cable system where I use a Technogym Kinesis 1 and I have the, the ability to move all over, whether it's dumbbells or kettlebells. And it's not just the equipment. It's the actual variation of motion. So it's not just linear, so to speak. It looks like you're kind of dancing almost depending on what you're using a lot of, a lot of Viper work is what I do. So there's, it's, it's, that's one of the things that I do, but another thing that I do and that I've been doing for 20 years now, a little over 20 years is I spend a lot of time doing various forms or, or techniques of foam rolling. So I'll do a lot of foam rolling. Um, I do a lot of different mobilizers, which is stuff that we do through Soma and by using different foam rolling and different mobilizers, you're able to get the body to reposition the tissues by putting forces in them differently and helping to, helping to prompt the tissue to make a change. So we're engaging the tissue, giving it the opportunity to make a change, whether it's mechanically, neurologically, and or typically it's both of those. And so that's how I bled that into my workout programs is very in my motion and then doing the self-care kind of tissue management stuff to make sure that my body is free enough and I have the, the ability to go into different planes of motion or different directions and variations of motion. And see, I think it's important for people to hear that, Rod, because the one thing that, that I think we do extremely well in the industry as educators is we educate people about the benefits of doing a certain type of mode, but I think we sometimes, we can be too convincing where if somebody comes to one of our workshops, they might never pick up a weight again and they might just do all fascial training. But you know, we, right. still, we still need to lift heavy weight, right? I mean, we still, well, let me take a step back. Do you think that sometimes that's the case that sometimes after a workshop, somebody might, might walk away from, from one of your field soma workshops and be like, okay, I'm going to only do this and not really focus much on doing traditional weightlifting. How important is it to incorporate both the, the strength training because we know that grows muscle and the fascia training? How important is yeah, that for a program? It's, it's absolutely, absolutely vital. So one of the things that we've done with Soma, um, to your point, having been an, an educator for 20 years now in, in this industry, in Soma, we specifically reference the whole movement continuum. Our bodies have to be able to move slow and subtle and big and fast. So there is a, there's a whole process. And so when we talk about SOMA, we don't just talk about, hey, this is what you need to focus. No, it's this is why we need to do this so we can do the other things. You don't want to replace. They, our industry is a pendulum industry. It's either this or it's that. And people go one way or the, or the other. And in reality, it should be a continuum industry. And a continuum means I should be doing some of this throughout all of my days. So whether it's week, whether it's in cycles of, you know, it's, it's in a, it's in a uh, meso cycle instead of a macro cycle, which is a lot of times what we do. Usually people get periodized by God periodizes. It says, okay, you, you're crap. Now your body just <laughs> broke down. You spent way too much time doing the same thing. Your body's going to let you know, and then you have to do something by default. 
But if we can periodize that in, if we can bring in some tissue recovery, if we can bring in some variant motion, then we can still do all the things we want to do, but you're going to move better, be healthier. And that's the key. And so that's what we've really tried to bring out is, no, no, what we're going to show you is a way to help your body take, help you take care of your body. So your body is prepared and able to continue to do those things. Um, th- some, of the, some of the people who've gotten some of the most incredible benefits is CrossFitters. Because CrossFit is intense and they lift heavy and they go hard. But when we bring in some of this stuff into that arena, it's like, oh, my goodness, I can now actually move. I can get my arms above my head. I can squat down with my arms above my head. And I don't have that restriction. I don't have that pain. I'm not getting either too much or not enough movement out of my lumbar spine or thoracic spine. So that's the the power of it. And we can't throw one out with the other. We have to incorporate. You have to use some load at some time uh, because the body needs that. It's good for bone tissue. It's good for muscle tissue. It's good for the fascial matrix. We need to have both the slow and, and simple and the heavy and the fast relative to your ability level. Not That's not a general statement. Everyone should move heavy and everyone lift. It's relative to your ability. My heavy may not be the same as someone else's heavy. My fast may not be the, the, the same as someone else's fast. And that's an important distinction to make. I mean, I think it really is because we do sometimes get stuck in one mode. And for listeners that, that may not be familiar with mesocycle and macrocycle, what Rod's talking about is like blocks of time, like four, eight, six right. weeks. And what I try to get people thinking about is if you're going to lift heavy, think of it in six to ten week, in a six to ten week block. So if you're going to do a barbell uh, cycle, you're doing heavy barbell for six to ten weeks. But then after that, you're going to still lift but do something different and put a different force in the body. How important is that to kind of think about structuring the workouts to just apply different forces in the body? It's it's absolutely. It's I mean, all the things that you're talking about, Pete, these, these are vital. These are these are essentials in someone who's working out. And this is where we lack is sometimes people just it's pedal to the metal. And they just keep going until they hit a wall. Um, and even in that six to 10 week cycle where you're doing something specific is bleed in a little bit of something else. So yes. whether it's part of your warm up or whether it's part of a, an active uh, rest period. Uh, so some of the things we talk, we talk about in SOMA is during your rest period or part of the warm up or even the cool down is you bring in some of the foam roll, you bring in some of the mobilizers, some of the things that are real subtle for the body, even, even though you may not be doing a lot of three dimensional movement in a, in a barbell cycle where you're doing a lot of squats or bench or deads or something, you can still bring in three-dimensional movement in the active rest period. Because if you're going heavier, your rest periods are more than likely a little bit longer, depending on what type of training you're doing. So take 30 seconds and just do what we call a simple fascial mobilizer, which is a real slow, subtle movement, but it's in a three-dimensional capacity to the body's ability. And by doing that, you just allow the body to recover And you allow the tissue to not get stuck in a certain pattern so you don't build up, uh, just for lack of a better term, you build up a scar tissue that can then down the road create a a glitch in the system where all of a sudden your back goes out when people say, oh, my back just went out. Or you start getting agitation in the knee or the shoulder joint, which is now decreasing your ability to do something. And just just for listeners, I mean, you talk about now, you, you know, this type of training quite literally, or maybe you're, you're being a little figurative, but saved your life. I've had uh, numerous issues, and, and now at, at 46 years old, almost 47, yo, know, yeah, I have little, I, I, I'm more in more pain after a 12-hour flight of not moving than yeah. I am after swinging a 70-pound ke- you know, kettlebell, you know, mm-hmm. and so understanding how to move the body in all planes and understanding how to load force, because when I look at it, I try to get people thinking about if they're, if they're doing heavy strength training, I only want them doing like three heavy strength sac- cycles in a year. So out of a year, I, I, I'm really trying to encourage maybe between 20 and 30, 24 and 30 weeks of really heavy strength training. And the other, you know, 20 weeks or so, give or take, 20, 24 weeks, is really a lot of movement training, a lot of, you know, it's like, okay, you're going to do 10 weeks of heavy strength training. Then let's do two or three weeks of just focus on movement, focus on maybe TRX, body weight stuff. And, and the stuff that I'm seeing and the stuff I'm feeling is like, wow, you can still get your strength training and you can still feel better and move better as well. And I think... The tough thing is how do we get that message out? You know, how do we how do we promote that? And and the, what I want to talk about just a quick shift is because if people do that regularly, according to Robert Schleip, 
Isn't it mm-hmm. possible that they can re, re kind of pattern their entire fascial architecture in a relatively short period of time? Yeah, absolutely, Pete. And that's that's a huge thing because there's two components to that. So one, according according to well, and, and it's beyond Schleip. So Dr. Schleip, who's a, a fantastic researcher, done tons of stuff in the in the, the realm of fascia, but just looking at Davis's law. So yeah. going back to years ago, hundreds, hundred and plus years ago, when Davis stated that soft tissue molds along the lines of, of stress or force. If we just understood that, however I move my body is how my body is going to construct its internal support system. So if I only move it a certain way, it's going to get really strong in that certain way. But as soon as I go out of that, I'm lost. And it's not just mechanical. It's neurological. It's proprioceptively. It means my body not only forms a structural mechanical grid, but it also creates a, a neurological schematic or a representation of that. So it knows where I'm going and how far I'm able to go in those other directions. If I don't train those other directions, I don't have that grid. I don't have that capacity. So when I move there, my body's like, whoa, I have no idea where you're going. I'm totally lost. And it's like in a GPS when you, you go off on a road somewhere and it's like, <laughs> yeah, your GPS just went blank. That's the same thing. It's like it hasn't been down this road. We don't know where this, this is taking you. So good luck. And then the, everything, everything just kind of shuts down on again. People are like, oh crap, I just blew something. That's that's the power of it. So yeah, the body can make changes pretty quick. I have clients who, I have clients who are the absolute representation of watching tissue change over a period of a couple of weeks. I had a lady. I, I always I use this lady because she's like amazing. She was seventy four when she came to me. She thought she had a brain tumor. She didn't have a brain tumor. She had way too much. Uh, trigger point activity in her neck and shoulders, causing her tons of migraine headaches and pressure in her head and all this stuff, yada, yada. Anyways, just in a real simplistic, her trapezius muscles, which is the muscles on the top of the neck when people get all anxious and stressed out, they usually use those to hike their shoulders up. There was so much tissue buildup in that area that you could literally take a, like a stick, so one of the massage sticks, you could take that and roll it down her trap muscle and watch it just go gunk, off this cliff and you could almost hear it and but it was hilarious and it was just like a, this solid matted ball until you put pressure on it and it shot pain through her whole head so after pr- no more than four weeks there was no longer this big clump now the pain had subsided so we had got the trigger point to to free up and there was no longer referral pain into her head from that area However, their tissue was still built up. So it took an extra couple of weeks. So the first couple of weeks, we got the trigger point away. After that, the tissue built up. And within another couple of weeks, she no longer had the big lumps in her. And that's just by placing a different force and making sure that the force we were play- placing was appropriate to her mental and emotional capacity as well as her physical capacity. And pretty soon, that was all gone. Now, fast forward a year and a half. She doesn't have any of those symptoms. She doesn't have any of those symptoms. She doesn't have any of the problems. And her tissue is completely different. It feels like a normal tissue when you roll the stick or your hands over that. So that's, that's the importance of it. It's allowing, the second component is allowing for recovery. Because the, the, the body will not make the changes that you want it to make or need it to make unless the body is recovered. And part of this whole thing that we're talking about, Pete, when you're talking about getting people to cycle through body weight training or cycle through different types of training and not the the other 30 weeks of the year or 25 weeks of the year, that's called recovery. You're putting them in a state where there's not as much stress coming into the system or the stress is in a much different form. And that allows the whole system to recover. And the recovery of the system, both mentally, emotionally, as well as physically, is what allows the tissue to then start to morph and reformulate into a much more healthy structure and not decrease in its ability to support your, your, your entire network. Woo-hoo, so I know what I'm talking about. No, <laughs> I yeah, mean, I, I yes think, you do. No, but I mean, I think it's important for people to hear that because we get so, I get, like I said earlier, we get so caught in these paradigms and we get stuck in these things. And typically guys our age, late 40s, early 50s, have been doing the same workout and the same exercises yeah. for years. And so for people out there that might have these pains, 
just changing up their program can just be significant. Now, the next thing I want to talk to you about, and this is an area I've heard you lecture on this a couple of times, and to me, it's fascinating. And that's the relationship between motion and emotion. You've already alluded yeah. to it a little bit. How does emotion affect our movement and, and just the way our body moves and the way we hold our body? Well, it's, it's simple because, you know, going back to a learning paradigm, our educational system and the way we learn and teach is that you got the mental and you got the physical. They're separate. And you got the, the movement and you got the, the, the mindset and they're separate. And they're all the same because they're, they all reside within the same human being. And that human being just happens to live in a human body. So they're one in the same. And the easiest way that everyone can prove it to themselves is if I simply told them, I said, hey, show me what someone who's really anxious looks like. Show me anxiety. 100% of the people, 100% of the time can show me what anxiety looks like. And if I say, show me what a sad person would look like walking down the street, 100% of the people, 100% of the time can show me what someone who's sad looks like. How is it? How is it that I can tell you an emotional state or a mindset state and you can show me physically what it looks like? It's because what I mentioned earlier, the, the, your mindset, what your thoughts and your feelings are will manifest somewhere. They don't just float around in, in nothingness. They're inside your human body. Your being is inside your body and they're intermeshed. And so it will create that picture for you. So we can create, that's why we can read people's faces. You know when someone is authentic when they're smiling or whether they're kind of making up the smile. You know when someone's authentic with the way that they speak, the tone of their voice or whether they're not. We have those intu in, 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 kind of that intuitive sense that we're all capable of. And that's because how we feel and how we move are intimately tied. So you can change someone's motion by changing their emotion. So if, if, if everyone that was listening just said, okay, I'm going to pretend that I'm super anxious. I'm totally stressed out. And that's going to change your, your posture, the, the position of your limbs and the position of your body. And I said, go ahead and squat three times, squat three times in that super anxious state. And you guys squat three times. And I ask, okay, so how does that feel? Was that a good experience? 99.9% .9 of the people say, nope, that was not a good experience. And so I said, okay, now just pretend that you just won the lotto. So it was $365 million. You just won that. You get to go on vacation forever. You don't have to worry about going back to work. <laughs> now I want you to squat. And immediately everything changes. Well, what changed? You were just pretending, but what changed? The only thing that changed was your mindset, your thought process. What was your, your emotional feeling? And it was pretend. So think of how someone feels like that when it's real. And so by changing someone's mindset, you can change their motion. Well, conversely, by changing someone's motion, you can change their emotional state because they go, it's a two way street. It's just not one. So when you get movement that maps more precisely or coincides better with a person's behavioral style or behavioral patterns, what I call a movement style. And when we went through PTA Global, we called it our, our movement style. It was your most style. When you can get someone to move that feels more like them or is more in tune with what they would like to see and do as a movement, that changes how they feel. They don't have the innate kind of wall, that, that anxious wall that goes up like, oh, crap, I'm being asked to do something that I don't know if I can do and I don't think it's going to be fun and I don't like. You get a tension. So if we can decrease the emotional barrier to the movements by understanding what type of movement may be a better motion for that person to go through, then we can change how they feel during the motion, which then in turn creates an association with, hey, this isn't so bad which is one way that we can start building a habit towards the desire to want to have a healthier lifestyle because now I don't mind moving like this, but I may not want to move like that. And that's one of the things where emotion and motion become extremely powerful for a fitness professional because it becomes a very powerful marketing and sales tool because you're now connecting 
with that person. And that's what it's all about is can I connect with this person? The best way to connect with a client is to give a client something that looks and feels like them, not looks and feels like you. And, and that, that's and that, well, I'm going to say that's really important because I think a lot of people that are trainers get stuck and train their clients like themselves. Yeah. And and I heard you lecture on this, your rod, like I said, a while ago. And I noticed, you know, I, I live in San Diego and I've done a lot of work in Boston and New York and the New, New England. And the one thing I no, really noticed is watching people walk in the two cities, you know, watching people walk on the East Coast versus people walk on the West Coast. Like mm-hmm. in one of the East Coast cities, you see people, they're hunched over, they they got mm-hmm. bags on them, they're kind of rushing around, they're very, they're just, you can see the tension. And it's yeah. funny, when you're just using that example about squatting, like the anxiety, I don't know mm-hmm. about listeners, but I could feel my body, I could almost feel the cortisol and the epinephrine <laughs> dumping in my body, <laughs> exactly. thinking about anxiety, and all of a sudden you get locked up, your shoulders come in, you hunch over a little bit, you're like, shoot, I got, you know, I mean, we're talking on a day when a lot of people have to turn something into the federal government, so there mm-hmm. might be some anxiety going on, and people can feel that. <laughs> You know, versus here on the West Coast, when like say you go on a Pacific Beach or Ocean, Ocean Beach, and you see people chilling out by the beach, and they're just kind of hanging out, they're walking. There's definitely like on the East Coast, people are hunched over and r- hurrying all about. Mm-hmm. Whereas on the West Coast, people are kind of slacking back, and they're wearing shorts and their flip flops, and they're kind of they have a very different gait pattern in general that's not yeah. specific to one or the other. Have you noticed that? And isn't that isn't that an interesting facet that basically your environment can affect so much about your body? Absolutely, 100%. So your environment is part of, it's it's distinctly part of who you are. So your environment will dictate certain thoughts and attitudes and choices, and that'll dictate behaviors. So, and most of the time for most of us, that's completely subconscious. So most people aren't even aware. Half the time people aren't aware of their environment because it's where they've been for a long time, unless you change your environment. But and that's why a lot of times when people change environments, there's an, there's an uncomfort or unease until they realize that you, know, you come from the East Coast and you're all hunched over and you get on the West Coast. And, and, I, and I love that because you, I mean, you brought up the East Coast and West Coast, and I just always think immediately of Bobby Capuccio. So I remember Bobby Capuccio, and if you don't know him, you got to look him up. <laughs> but, but, you know, with Bobby, he came from the East Coast to the West Coast. And when he got to the West Coast, it was like, it, it, he had, it was like, whoa, I got I to gotta kind of slow down and I got to figure this out and so he now for the most part walks and talks differently than he did when he was on the east coast until he gets back to the east coast and it's just bam right back into that <laughs> so that's absolutely 100 percent true that's 100 percent true and that's the same so your environment that's the same in the workout environment uh and then that's the same with what types of movements are you being given inside the environment that you're in so for most people, the environment, if the environment isn't accommodating or comfortable, there's already a stress level or an anxiety level. And so you think from a fitness professional standpoint, how many of your clients coming into the gym are comfortable in the gym? So if they're not comfortable in the gym and there's already a stress factor there, then mount you know, all the stress that they're going through that day, you know, whether they have an argument with their boss or their spouse or their significant other, whoever it was, was there how much stress are they coming into with? And then what are you giving them? What types of exercises or exercises that they're completely uncomfortable with? And, and people always say, well, yeah, but it's good for them. That exercise could be good for them based upon a research article that says this is a great core exercise or group exercise. But if it doesn't fit that person, it doesn't matter what the research says. And yeah. so if we can get an exercise or exercises, which is what determines a program that feels like them and has more of the flair of movements that they would like, now you've decreased one of the stressors. And that's huge when you have someone who's already stressed. You know, and, and that's funny. So what you're saying that, that a personal trainer should develop a movement program that's personalized to the individual they're working with? Are you, are, is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to really emphasize that word personal in the training. <laughs> Where that it's comes not in. Pers- it's not personal meaning my personal belief in training. It's their personalized program for them. Well, and that's, I think, we, we've, we've lost that definition of what, okay, what personal are we talking about? My as the trainer or them as the client? 
Well, I have to say, I mean, I, and I, this stuff to me was, was somewhat, I don't want to say intuitive, but it, it kind of made sense years ago when I was working with attorneys in DC, I would notice that when I'd get client, you know, attorneys coming into me, I, sometimes I just, we'd start out our session. I'm just giving them whatever I'd planned for that day. I'd give them like a three pound or a five pound medicine ball and just start having to throw it around and mm-hmm. to see their energy change. You know, they might be yep. coming to see me midday or in the afternoon where they've been at their office for five, six, seven hours, just jacked to heck with stress. And then I get, mm-hmm. you know, to, to throw a medicine ball just in different patterns and nothing, nothing to, but just, I want to get them to move and throw something and to see their body change and to see their energy and just their overall demeanor change yep. was, was so powerful. And now what I want to ask you before we get ready to wrap up, when we had a conversation before, you told me about a client that you worked with, an older guy who had been a football player and, and how you really kind of engaged him to really get him back to kind of his former self. What what did you do? You know, if you can go into that a little bit, like, do you know who I'm talking about? The one. Yeah, well, there, there's a there's a there's a variety of things. So um, with this person is we we use. So first off, you bring out a football and immediately everything changes because now it's like, oh, you've given them a known something that they're comfortable with, even though the environment was inside a club. There was a football, and every you, it's just like you were saying with the medicine ball to the to the lawyers. You bring out the football, and all of a sudden everything changes. And so when and this is this is part of there, there's a, there's there's a ton to this. There's a whole process and a whole system behind all the stuff we're saying. So it's not like just hearsay. But if you if you know who your client is, you have some background information. What are their hobbies? What are their recreational activities? What have they done? Um, what what types of movements do they like, dislike, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And you realize, okay, this person's played football and their conversation, there's a lot of football based into that. Um, Then what I do is I'll use one, I'll bring out a football a lot of times or something that has some leather to it. So when I bring out a medicine ball, so I still I still work with this guy and I'll bring out a some of the the, Dynamax balls that are kind of leather. So when when he touches that, he feels that he just wants to like just crush it so he'll he just immediately changes and everything starts feeling better and he instantly moves better why because he's emotionally in a much more relaxed and comfortable state even though he's wants to be aggressive he's still in a relaxed state and he feels comfortable so his movement is far better than if we gave him a kettlebell or some type of plastic object that doesn't have the same emotional tie to him and then a lot of the drills we do, depending on what the drill is, even, even using a cable, is we'll put him in positions where, and he was alignment, where he was, there was, it'd be like pass blocking. So as soon as I say pass blocking, and I want you to step and put both your hands forward, which a lot of people would say it'd be like a step with a chest press, I just say we're going to do some pass blocking. So I just want you to step forward with that right foot and bring both hands up that you're holding the cable and then hit my hands. So I hold my hands there so he can hit my hands and contact something, which he's he loves because it's just it's just like, a oh, this brings me back. And then we get to talk about all the old stories. But just adding in components of things that they do, things that they enjoy doing, things that they told you about. If you can bring that enjoyment into the session, now you've pulled it from their outside world, that environment that they enjoy. And you pulled it into this environment, the gym environment. So now there's an association, hey, this is actually cool and fun. I can use leather objects or even the object that I was using. I can do exercises that mimic some of the things that I used to do. And now I'm actually having a fun workout. And that's a completely different person and a completely different session than someone who's just doing exercises that were pulled off of YouTube that were supposed to be the best exercises in the world that the person absolutely hated, so it didn't work. Well, I didn't want to go there to referencing YouTube and Instagram for exercise selection, but yeah, that's that's a whole other <laughs> conversation for another day. Now, this and this isn't a guy. This isn't a client like a former football player, like in in their late twenties, early thirties. You're talking about somebody with a few more years under their belt, correct? He's seventy years old. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I love about that story is you're engaging him. And how, how have you seen him change? I mean, overall, what do you think is more important? What do you think more, is more important, Rodney? Do you think at that, when you start working with people in that age group, what do you think is more important? The emotional, the spiritual, of just being somewhere where somebody cares about them? Or is it the physical? And how, or does it all tie together? It all ties together. So the, I think one of the things that we all have to be careful about is can you separate those? Because that's the questions that we typically do. And that's what research has done is what's the most important, which is the most contributing. It's 
it's hard because they all fit together. So for, for my clients, so 80% of my clients are over the age of 55. So I train an older adult population, but I don't train them like old, old cronies. It depends on some of them. So this 70 year old, that boy gets after it. I mean, he'll get after it. And there's days that he feels better and there's days that he doesn't. So we train more on the day, you know, a little bit more intense and a little bit more aggressive on the days that he feels better than the days he doesn't. That's just, that's kind of a natural. I and mean, you should do that with every client. Oh, absolutely. So if they're not yeah. feeling it, then, then don't, don't make them feel it. Or for so, listeners, sorry, but to cut in for yeah. listeners who exercise on their own, those days when, I mean, give yourself permission. If, if you work Absolutely. out regularly and, and you have that day where you're trying to warm up, but, but you just whatever, you might have other things going on, give yourself permission to take the day off. I mean, how yeah. important is it for, if I'm like, if, if I'm going through work stress, life stress, and I'm trying to force a workout, how important is it for me just to maybe bail on that and go for a walk outside? Yeah, it's huge. And again, for those who are listening Remember the word recovery because recovery leads to adaptation. Stress without recovery leads to breakdown. Stress with recovery leads to adaptation. And when I say adaptation, I mean you get a positive change in the direction that you want to go. So when people don't take a recovery time or they don't, they don't listen to their body, and, and this is where we have to be very careful with, with the periodization concepts where we're going to plan out our workouts for weeks have the structure in place, but if you show up one day and you didn't sleep very well, you're kind of dehydrated, you're not feeling super good, don't do the workout at the level that you needed to do it at that particular day, especially if it was a high intensity day or a heavy day. Don't do it that day because you won't benefit from that. You'll actually break yourself down and you'll put yourself deeper into a hole. If you take the, either the day off or you dra dramatically decrease the amount of force, stress, load put in your system. Because anytime you work out, that's added stress. Like it or not, that's just how it works. The, if you take that time off, your body will thank you for it the next day or the next week or the next month. So you have to invest. Recovery is the investment. The, the actual training session is a trigger mechanism. And so you're triggering stress. If your body's prepared for it, excuse me, then it will respond as long as you recover. If the body is not prepared for the, the investment of stress into the system, it's going to leak and it's going to break down somewhere. So that's what we have to look at is understand what a training session is and understand the power of what recovery is. And that's how you achieve your goals in a much healthier manner. And, and that is so powerful to people to hear. And to, to add one footnote to that, what I've started doing, especially on Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, is I've started asking people about what their plans are for the evening. And, mm -hmm. and the reason why I do that is because if you tell me if like it's a, you know, because Thursday night you, people might go out for dinner or something like that. Because if you tell me if I'm working with you, Rod, and you tell me, okay, my, my wife, I'm taking my wife out. We have, you know, we're going out with some friends. We're doing this. I am not going to crank you up that day. Because I assume if you're going out to dinner, if you're going to a show, that you might have an extra cocktail or two. And I'm not going to judge. You know, I'm not going to judge anybody for that. But I know that's going to affect your quality of sleep because you're going to be out of your regular habit. So what I do is I, I ask people on, on like on a weekend night, it's like, all right, what are your plans? Are you, you know, do, you, do you have any evening plans? If the answer is yes, I automatically downregulate the workout for that day. I don't give them the hardest workout because I know their sleep is going to be affected. But if you told me, eh, I don't really have any plans, I think we just, you know, just, my wife and I just might pull something up on Netflix or Amazon Prime. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. If all the other systems are a go, I'm going to put my foot in you a little bit and push you a right. little bit harder. You know, right. you know, how important is it for people to think of holistically about their programs, not just what you're doing today, but what you're doing for the next two or three days? And is that going to let you uh, recover and adapt to the workout that you did today? Yeah, and that's what has to happen. I mean, that's what personalized training is. So personalized training is finding out what exercises are going to best map to that person and then understanding who that person is today and training them for that today. Don't train that person for a standard that they have to meet. Train that person for who they show up to be. So to that point, the one thing you're talking about, one thing that listeners should be very, very aware of, especially if you're training someone uh, who's in the business world, who they have to do presentations, they have to get up in front of people, uh, whoever that may be. It, it can be teachers, it can be, it, but if anyone has a, an event coming up, let's say you're training someone and they're your 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. client or 7 a.m. client, and at 11 a.m. today or 2 p.m. today, 
they have to give a presentation to their boss or in front of the company. And you decide that you're going to beat the living crap out of them on that in this particular session because they're all amped up because they're excited about what's coming up or they're kind of stressed about what's coming up and I'm going to train them hard. You're going to decrease their ability to have proper cognition. You're going to decrease their ability to have proper decision making. You're going to decrease a lot of the abilities for them to do what they need to do in that session. So we need to understand 100% who is my client today, what has happened over the last 24 to 48 hours, what's going to happen in the next 24 hours, so we can set them up for that. And it's not difficult. It's it's just simple questions, and you know there there's all there's questionnaires that exist already out there. Is do you know how your client has slept? Do you know how they've eaten and drinking? Do you know what type of pain or agitation is in their body right now? And what do they have to do for the rest of the day? When you know some of those things, now it's easy to say, okay, based on this, I just have to modify this. Usually it's a volume thing. And when we say volume, it doesn't mean that you have to decrease someone's weight. It just means that they may use the same weight but do two less repetitions of it and do two less sets of it. But they still get to feel the weight. It just depends on the person. So understand that volume changes in a workout does not necessarily mean that you have to take the teddy bear away from them. So if they love weight, then you don't have to take that from them. If they love a certain exercise, you don't have to take that from them. It's just how much of it do they get that particular day so you minimize the stress that's coming in so you don't over, overflow or overspill the stress bucket and the stress system and send them into an alert. That's all. That's an important message. I think. I mean, see, people. I think a lot of people when they first get into training, right? Is they, they they're gym rats. They love you know. They love how it makes them feel. They love how it makes them look. And I just think they what they don't even realize how much there is to the body. You know, emotion. You know, tissue. Everything. And that's why I think what you do is so important. How can people find out more information about about soma and and what you and Ian are doing? So they can just go to the website, which is www feelsoma.com that's f-e-e-l-s-o-m-a feelsoma.com there's also a youtube site on that uh, we have a facebook so all of it's feel soma and that's i mean that's important for people to to, to realize and, and what do they learn if they come to a, a soma workshop i mean what i mean obviously you're going to go into this but but how how much detail do they get and how what how does that affect or how can that change their their business well, it, it, it instantly impacts your business because when you leave, you walk away with two powerful things. Number one, you walk away with the ability to take care of yourself. And what we found is that it doesn't sound like much initially, but you now have the ability. You've gone through the, the two days of training with us and you feel better yourself after that. So this workshop is as much for you as it is for your business because you are your business. And, now, and well, sorry, go ahead. And then the second component is you now have the specific application and ability to use the tools that you've been given, the, the different strategies. And so we go through what we call um, self osteofascial engagement, which is using the foam roll, but in a way that is typically not seen or done. And then the self fascial mobilizers, very simple ways to help the body feel better instantly. And it's an instant change, how it feels better instantly. So then your clients have the ability to move better prior to their workout or during their workout, as well as recovering from their workout on the, the end of the session or even the next day. So there's an immediate takeaway. So the ROI is instant. But beyond that, what we found is a lot of these trainers, a lot of the people that come to us are broken. Now, I'll give you a for instance. I was just at the IDEA PTI conference in, uh, in Virginia last weekend, and one of the ladies came up to me after this, after the two hour workshop, it was just only a two hour workshop. She only got two exercises and she said, I've been in pain for 18 months. She goes, I've had this, this back, low back kind of SI joint thing for two months. I've been to chiropractic, I've been to physical therapy. This is not a knock on those. It's just what she's gone through and what she told me and nothing has worked. She goes, after these two exercises, I was able to sit down in a chair for the first time without discomfort or without moving. And she goes, and then, then I saw her the next day, and she said, I haven't had pain at all last night. Slept good. All the different things that she hadn't done in 18 months after just a couple of things. Well, that's huge because now she's in a different place 
And if we're mentally in a different place as a trainer, coach, fitness professional, whatever you call yourself, you immediately exude a different confidence level. And that it immediately influences the person in front of you. But she now knows that she has a few different tools that she can show her clients and she's speaking from experience. So when she can do a similar thing to her clients, then she now has established a different level of value. And it's about establishing value to people to show them, hey, this is what I can help you with and this is what I can do. In the, in the two-day workshop that we have, the, the Soma Immersions is what we call them, you learn – a lot of different areas of the body to address and how to program them, but more specifically, how to specifically do them so you're doing them precise and accurately. Now, the, the question of, of I think the hour is you, you primarily you, you do this for fitness professionals so they can help clients, but the average person can attend one of your workshops, right? If somebody's listening to this and go, oh my goodness, this is what I need and I'd love to figure out how to keep myself out of pain. Could the regular, I mean, could, could the average, Absolutely. could like the, you know, somebody's a fitness geek join you for mm-hmm. one of these weekends? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've had, we've had, uh, we've had a number of people in our workshops around the world who've just been there because they just wanted to learn. They just wanted to help themselves and they're just as welcome and they get the same response and the same effect as the people who are different. We've had different allied health professionals. We've had all different types of people that show up to that. So absolutely 100%. All right. Well, Rodney Korn with uh, Feel Soma, you know, with, for listeners, I'd want to try to get Ian O'Dwyer on the phone, but he's about 20 time zones away and just logistics <laughs> of that. And I'll, I'll do a follow-up with a follow-up interview with OD at some point because yeah. uh, he is just, he, he I, the, the two of you together are phenomenal, but he also brings in a, a different perspective that just it's, it's not it, it just it just opens us up. Well, Rodney, I really appreciate it. And, and, I, and for listeners, I'm going to have a lot of information below in the show notes about Feel Soma, a little bit more information about Rodney. So if this is something you're interested in, you definitely can learn more about it and figure out how you can use it to help you or help your clients. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pete. First, before I get into the outro for the conversation with Rodney, I think I need to add him to the list with uh, Rick Ritchie and Mark Cornell about having possibly one of the uh, sexiest sounding voices in podcasting. If you haven't heard Rick Ritchie on the Omnia Fitness Podcast, uh, by all means, uh, you might want to check that out. Rick is uh, Rick and Drogar are putting out some great stuff on there. As you can, you know, it's one of those things where when I interview somebody like Rodney, it's easy for me to geek out a little bit and to get a little lost because he really is one of those guys that I used to see. I basically followed Rodney around but in the early 2000s. Between 2002 and 2006, I taught the NASM certification under contract for a large health club company. And in 2006, I went through the NASM. NASM, the National Academy of Sports Medicine, worked with the California University of Pennsylvania, which is a state college in the Pennsylvania system. And I went through that master's program. They did a master's program in exercise science and health promotion. And NASM helped develop some of that curriculum. Rodney, Scott Lucette, and those guys really kind of helped create it. And it was really, it was those guys who who were influential in me wanting to become an educator. I saw Rodney, Lenny, Bobby, you know, other speakers out there, Juan Carlos Santana. And these guys really, they showed that not only could you be a trainer, but that you could take it a step, take it the next step and, and help other trainers learn how to be more effective. He is one of those guys that has done that. He's had such a strong impact on everything we've done. I mean, Rodney's worked with NASM. He's worked with the group, helped create PTA Global. He's basically written two personal training certifications. And that's a very powerful thing for people that if you have never heard of Rodney, I can guarantee you, if you've never heard of Rodney Korn, and you probably haven't heard of some of these fitness educators, but I can guarantee you that if you take a fitness class, if you do a workout with somebody anywhere, almost anywhere in the world, that something you would do in that class or any workout has been influenced by Rodney and been influenced by the team, the former team at NASM. That's why what they're doing is so powerful. And Rodney is really taking it to the nth degree. I mean, what we, for years, exercise has focused on, and we got to take this back centuries, right? Because when we first started looking at the human body, we tried to break it down to individual systems. The skeletal system is different than the muscular system. Muscular system is different than skin. Skin is different than brain. Brain is different than fascia. Fascia is different than nerves. Nerves are different than organs. So we tried to, when we started studying the body, we broke everything up into individual systems, but we forgot this one point. The body starts as a single cell. When the egg and the sperm meet, that forms one cell. Everything spins out. Everything is subdivided off of the single cell in vivo. And, and now 
you know, we, as, a, as a human adult, we have millions of cells in us, but it all comes down to the cellular level and everything is integrated in our body. You cannot do something for your muscles without considering how it's impacting your fascia. You can't do something for your fascia without considering how it's impacting your emotional system. Your emotions will impact your digestive system. Your digestive system will impact other parts of your body. Everything is interconnected. So to go into a health club and to do this, this idea of, I'm going to train one part of my body at the expense of others is, is antiquated. I mean, you know, we're going back centuries. We're going back hundreds of years of just, I don't want to say wrong, but misguided thought because we try to break everything down into its individual components. So leaders like Rodney, you know, educators like Rodney, I'm going to link below. I'm going to have, again, I'm going to link below to the interview I did with Thomas Myers because I had originally wanted to interview Tom, you know, Thomas and Rodney and Ian together and have a series, but just I had a had an equipment foul up when I interviewed Tom um, when I interviewed Rodney and Ian, and so I had to kind of table that. And this is a, a follow up interview off of what we originally discussed a, a number of months ago. But I'm, I needed to get this interview out there because this is such important information. How you feel dictates how you move. How you move dictates how you feel. And for somebody who's had their body beat up, I you know, was a BMX racer in my high school. I played rugby for a number of years. I've fallen down. I've gotten slammed. I have to tell you, it, at my age, with the surgeries I've had, with the various, and I haven't had a surgery. I guess the last technical surgery I had was in 99. I had to, yeah, I had to have my L4, L5 disc repaired. But at my age now, 46 going on 47, I feel good. I can lift more weight than I could when I was in my 20s. I can lift more weight than I could 20, 25 years ago. But here's the thing. I structure, just like you heard us talking about, and I do this with clients and I do this with classes, I structure workouts for myself and for clients, periods of you know two, you know know two to three months of heavy, really higher intensity activity, followed by periods of maybe two to four weeks of, let's just take a little load off. Let's focus on moving. And yeah, we, we'll go back to heavy dates. Don't worry about it. But what I'm finding, what I'm feeling, feeling both you know personally and, and seeing, is that it's having a world of difference. So with your exercise, don't get stuck in any one modality. You know, you may like Pilates, you may like indoor cycling, you may like kettlebell training, but you need to do everything. Listen to experts like Rodney. Just don't listen to me. You know, again, I'm just somebody that's a trainer. I have maybe a little more education than a regular trainer. But what we can do is we can help you move better. If you move better, you feel better. And to be honest, you know, I'm going to work in that plug right here. That's the purpose of my book, Smarter Workouts. You know, I, I take the influence I've had from people like Rodney and Gary Gray and Chuck Wolf. Those are a couple other names that are going to be down in the interviews below. I'm going to link back because Chuck Wolf really goes into Chuck's another educator at our level who for years has been teaching people how to move more efficiently. And that we had such a great interview a while back. I'm going to link to it below in the show notes. So you can learn a little bit more about the types of movement programs that you can do if you're, you know, a consumer, if you're, you know, a, a fitness enthusiast, or the type of programs that you can create if you're a trainer or an instructor. The resources are out there. I'm trying to put it out there. So, you know, that's what Smarter Workouts is about. That's what the podcast is about. It's helping you learn that exercise is much more than just lifting a weight. Exercise is much more than trying to sculpt a muscle or trying to get six pack abs. Exercise has to do with everything in your body. And the most important thing about exercise is it can literally change the way you feel. It can really change everything about your life if you do it the right way. If you want to learn what that is, you're listening to the right podcast, keep listening for free. I will always have this information out there. Obviously, the only thing I ask is that you support advertisers or you support the podcast by giving a review. If you want to learn more, that's why I wrote my book, Smarter Workouts. Obviously, there's going to be a link below in the show notes. And if you want to go to one of Rodney's workshops, if you see him at a conference, if you're just a, a consumer, a fitness enthusiast, and you want to learn a way, if you want to learn to move that can enhance your quality of life for the next 20, 30, 40, however many years you want to stay on this earth, I, I encourage you, it is worth your time, it is worth your investment to go do a weekend workshop with Rod. And I will have that information below in the show notes. I, I can't thank you enough. Just like those folks I saw recently in Florida, Marielle, Amber, Mariana, I, you know, thank you again. If you, if you see me out, you know, at an event or something, please introduce yourself. I, I love meeting people that listen to the podcast and love hearing your reaction to it. And, you know, if you take the time to review, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by. And I look forward to having you join me for future episodes of All About Fitness.